Hi there. So this is an update to a pattern exercise that I teach in dynamic drawings. Um, I did a video a while back, but it's definitely due for a refresher. And I thought I would do one with a practical constraint for painting patterns, because that's always been sort of even something I stumble on where I kind of have some arbitrary ones I teach in the class, but I often kind of invent them as I go, um, as things come up. Uh, there's definitely some I studied early on, but it's sort of an ongoing exercise. Uh, but a good way I thought to skip its structure in the class is to take uh, a drawing that you want to do a study of and break down the patterns used in it and turn them into exercises. So I'm using a piece of mine from a book coming up that I'm putting out. It's a part of a short story. So it's going to be in Mind Engine when that does get eventually finished. And its uh, current working title is A Crowning Fluorescence. Um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, and then it was inspired by the pandemic. So I wanted this really intense, the, the people living in this space painted that door. And I liked this sort of epic first shot opening visual. The patterns are um, busy, but the complexity is a bit of an illusion, I think, at least from how I look at it now. Um, and part of it helps is that I've used, I've used things here that I know well and have practiced before. So I'm going to break them down into a set of practices, uh, pattern exercises, and then also uh, show you some others you could do probably if they occur to me along the way. So I want to try to size this area in the camera frame nicely. And so I have ulterior reasons for, for doing that because and these don't have to be perfect, but this is like a good visual exercise. Right now I'm checking against a camera overhead and looking up because uh, I know that the camera is not perfectly square, but to the page. That's good. It's close. But also what I'm going to tell you to do is take like an eight and a half by 11 sheet. Right now I'm using 11 by 17 because it fits in the camera shot. It gives me a nice clean canvas, but eight and a half by 11 should fit nicely in there. And then I want you to draw in this closely. And when you're doing like the edge of the paper, let me show you this as I say it, then just use sort of your own finger as the measure. Uh, careful not to rub hard because you don't want to give yourself a paper cut, but just gently the sense of touch um hold the paper so that you can hold your pencil and touch the paper and use the sense of touch to guide it and it won't necessarily be perfect but it is a good way to keep it uh, parallel to the edge of the paper fairly well but again it doesn't actually have to be perfect for this exercise that's not the point of it and you keep doing that until you have a frame kind of like this then divide it in half so I want to observe this first time. I'm going to try to demonstrate by showing you too. Uh, there are easier and more difficult ways to draw a straight line. It's actually easier to draw one from here to here because all I'm doing is a very uncontrolled, a very controlled, sorry, I can alter it slightly here. There, by turning that, I can line it up. So I'm rotating the paper and lining up with my optimal straight line. And what I'm doing right now is just using the large hinges of my upper arm. So if you look at the small video, see what you can see here. So my elbow is swinging across and my shoulder is lifting and that cancels out each one's uh, internal arc. If I just did my elbow, I'd get a, an arch. If I just did my shoulder, the pay pencil would leave the paper. So we combine the movements to create a linear line. Isolating those uh, large muscle groups is something every time you have to do large line forms, you can exercise, you can do as an exercise. If you don't, if you want to say dry draw just this way, it's possible, but it's actually more challenging, but then maybe that's a reason to do it some. So divide it in half. Now I'm gonna divide those halves into a halves. This becomes an exercise in seeing proportion. Try to make your halves as accurate as you can without using a ruler. Not because you can't use a ruler, you can grab a ruler, but as a, a mental exercise, a visual exercise, 
the eyeballing of spaces and seeing. And halves are the sort of the easiest things to see if you spend a little time practicing. What I'm doing is making marks that I can then I may not use all of these cells as single cells, but I think I want the option to make fairly small. I haven't used a ruler, but I would estimate it's about an inch and a half. That's a little off. That's a little off. Close enough, though. And so now you can practice. You can do straight out. So that's a different set of bends, but it still should work. It's just I find there's a, a tendency to wobble more. It's a slightly less, in terms of the way your muscles are, are strung, slightly less, less optimal. But you can manage it. It's a good exercise to practice doing it, a harder thing. So all to say, it's worth taking this opportunity when perfect doesn't matter to... See if you can't isolate those muscles a bit. By contrast, just to feel the difference doing this along with me, take a couple and turn it so that the length of the side here is parallel to the length of your arm and your elbow falls in the middle of the forearm that you want to draw the line across. And now I'm using the two large joints a little more efficiently. That was uncomfortable. Let's get my shoulder down, not hunched. Tension is not your friend. It makes things actually stiffer, so the muscles don't move freely, and you get less precise work. You get more stiff work. So if you want kind of a tighter and potentially shakier line, um, more tension can help you. But you don't actually get smoother lines. You get smoother lines from fluid relaxed movements and sort of making optimal use of the joints and muscle connections. So in the crowning for lessons opening page, I want to bring it up for myself and let's see, let's put that on the page but make it smaller. I just need a visual reminder and you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, I don't need this corner over here so much. Yeah. That's cool. There we go. So, one of the easiest bits, I'm going to angle the paper slightly to favor my hand, is the vertical hatching I use for a lot of the shading in around uh, the lower areas on the wall and in general in the the uh, skull. Uh, I changed the angle on the skull to help differentiate it from the background. The, the wall is very vertical because it's very flat to us. And I used feathered about inch long lines that I didn't try to too perfectly blend. And I did in somewhat controlled waves. I'm using the feathering to help them blend, but actually trying to get a little bit of texture. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use these four squares and show how to practice modulating that. So here when we want the highlight, the spacing gets lighter, the lines get shorter. And with this kind of texture, you can make a choice about keeping very tight rows, or you can let that become organic. It doesn't make a big difference in density, 
but it can influence sort of the way the patterns that they create collectively appear. So right now I'm doing this with a, a color erase pencil that's black. So it's a little different than graphite. Uh, one of the things I like about it the most is that it does not smudge nearly as much. So while well, having good hand protocol and not drawing over things you've done here, but start this way and move, if you're right-handed, if you're left, then invert that and move away, away from your drawing if, as much as you can. You, you will have to go in and around and there's techniques for that. But you can maximize your options by not dragging your hand through it, but then you can also use color race black and then it happens but it's much less prone to it so what else did I use I used flowers and I have a lot of different patterns I, I do for flowers but the one I did for this is two basically there's the face of the flower that's pretty much it so I'm basically I'll enlarge it and so I'll come back sometimes and add a bit if I feel like I've left in too many big spaces but what I'm basically doing is if you slow down you're drawing something like a three-sided flower structure that just repeats which is exploiting the, the reality of fractals and I like sort of breaking that up the regularity of that up with an organic irregularity uh, and then you can start adding in some smaller petals if you want to get all that but the second pattern I did frequently for these let me just check next to me here again yeah when they're big sometimes I just did that and then I put one of those things at the end um, and you can see it's quite rough and some I just did uh, I showed them at three quarters so you start seeing one side and then they have leaves what well, looks like leaves this is a a painting of something we'll see, la see later which doesn't quite look like this it's an idealized symbol for the thing and so like unlike this this kind of pattern is less regular but there are still regularities so there are still constraints you can experiment with so fill an eighth of the page with experiments in leaf and floral form. So you can tick, uh, pick uh, Master Studies paintings or drawings to do this from. Uh, select the work of an artist. This is like for, if you don't have your own drawings already to refine and practice and work on things from, uh, and you're not planning one yet, you're still learning. Pick a, an accomplished artist who's doing things that you find quite enjoyable. And then a master study is, is the a master study is the process of deconstructing them. So you could do an isolated one by picking drawings of flowers. You'll also be able to, so as I'm demonstrating here, I'm going to put this picture as a downloadable. Uh, reasonable size screen JPEG so you can see the line work and you can use it yourself the way I am here. It'll be in the description text. So right here I'm doing sort of a jumble and something that I do a lot with these sorts of patterns is I have areas of more accurate detail and then areas where I start filling space with fragments of pattern 
that are derived from the shapes I'm seeing, and they'll be darker, denser, they're closer together. And so without having to think about, figure out, oh, is, is a flower land there? Like you can get into some craziness where you're planning three, four layers back for the shapes, but it helps when you're doing commercial art to know how to lie to the eyes a little bit. So here's another larger flower, but then I can fill in around it to help define it. And here, let's make that stock pattern. Let's do some fringing to have fun with. I'm starting to see a shape that I didn't really plan, but I like, so I'm going to turn this pattern into a full-fledged doodle and I define the difference being that to me doodles are like fun improvisational art that you didn't plan to make but happens along the way um, they're a little more intentional than a scribble There we go. Some flowers. What else did I have? Wood. I got boards of wood. So let's practice a few. Yeah, they're irregular too. So I'm, I'm thinking about a, an old industrial loft I lived in in my, my late teens on uh, DuPont Street in Toronto. It's a big two-story Hamilton gear building and the upper floor was rented out by people who didn't really care that we were living in it. Um, wasn't really meant to. I had a, sa a glass sand blasting place next door that probably wasn't healthy to live next to. And uh, would fire up their their uh, sand blasting machines pretty regularly and on weekends. So, good morning. Um, pottery shop on the side. They were cool ladies. I didn't really talk to them about much. And then later on, the sand blasting people got replaced by. No, actually, they did. They just moved over a unit. And then another pottery shop on the other side of me it's a cool building to be in for that period of my life it had actually been the uh workshop of a special effects uh team that had worked on the fly david cronenberg's the fly and they had props from the movie in the space for storage still and we came to visit it check it out so it was a fly pod and we inherited a bunch of fake t uh, tombstones styrofoam tombstones that had been there was a scene that was cut where um What's his name? Something Fly. So after the accident, Jeff Goldblum's character walks past a, 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 a tomb yard, a gravesite. There we go. Um, um, but they wanted to fill it in, so they did a bunch of fake ones. They didn't really care how they looked up close, so they were pretty crude and kind of funny. Um, I had them on the wall coming in the door for a while. It's a cool space. Um, where am I going to put them? Let's use that space. So the floorboards in some parts of the building. Oh, it's close to me. Being drinking lots of soda. They're very regular. Now let's make that Genuinely very regular. Let's end that one there because that happened every once in a while. Let's do another one. Once is an accident, twice is a pattern. Off at all, you'll see me do go to do a mark and I go, nope, too obvious. So I'm trying to find an interesting visual rhythm that feels just slightly chaotic. I did these in perspective in the drawing, you can see at the bottom, but it's basically the same idea. And then I want to just do light. Uh, so in the ink, I used uh, like a one, a point one, 
pan and very lightly dragged it back and forth in these long and sometimes spirally loopy patterns. I would try not to do that too much so I'll have patterns that don't repeat through, but it's okay if some do accidentally because the true sign of randomness is that coincidences occur. And so like the awareness, I don't have to draw actual mathematical fractals, but the awareness of a fractal pattern informs this here. My grain is another exercise in study your environment. Look at the patterns that you see and then learn how to decode them by learning a bit about how the world works, science, technology, architecture, history, politics, philosophy. I'm going to do a little cleanup on this one afterwards. Not anything major. This is just a rough pattern exercise study. And right now what I'm doing is working on fluidity, but I still also want a fair bit of control. I don't want it to be too messy. So I'm trying to balance, keep the drawings look gestural. That's an increasing push in my work. It just feels more pleasant to do, and I like some of the expressiveness that I get from it. But then I like to go in and also have more drafted bits. So this first bunch of lines I did, I let them be overlapping all of it, and I was knocking back as I was talking, because doing two things at once is never such a good idea, but it worked. Uh, and if you want to get into like some visible nail holes, that happens sometimes, and they weren't always in the same places. Like they would be often at those points, but often what you would do is see them line up across the boards because of course they are in studs, floor joists. So I'm better at remembering the names of uh, architectural, engineering, structural elements. And I am anatomy parts. <laughs> I just want to know where they are when I do anatomy. I don't don't care about what it's called too much. It does it doesn't help me remember things better. It's the actual mechanical doing, the muscle memory of many drawings of anatomy. So there's our floorboard pattern. Uh diagonal patching on a compound contour for the illusion of uh, so there's two things going on there there's in the painting there's lighting coming this way but in reality I have lighting coming this way so I'm going to ignore this one because it's actually a structural element and all I was doing is going down the side I'm not ignoring it I guess I'll duplicate it all I did is go down one side over the drawing and have the directional line of the light sort of indicated, but also I did it upwards to blend it with the tone of the painting, which is kind of not directionally indicated. It's actually against it. Like, if I really wanted to go with the direction, it should be down. But I have it going up because it creates sort of a, a poppy effect. And that does disagree a little bit, but then it also blends in with the art stuff. So I did that. So I'm suggesting the, the brow line of the skull. And then I also have a couple where I broke my rule where I did this. And I really should have done it this way, but with that short line, I didn't like the idea of the little short jagged lines. I didn't think it would work well. I returned to something like the same angle for this side. Uh, there was a bit of wanding there. And then there was some more below, but what I'm going to do is just 
show how I would shade in where they are in the drawings, the orbitals. Actually, I should do that. Yeah. So I'm going to shade in a little bit, make this like an under drawing. It's another variant on the floral pattern, but it's not actually the same one. It's a uh, noise meant to be looked at. So let's get out the same area so I can look at it while I'm doing it. Oops, bumped the camera. Uh, yeah, so at the center point, I did a clearly visible floral rose, sort of like the eyeball is. And then I had a bed of textural floral patterns around it. Um, I also, though, had white oat spots, which I believe I actually even did with a Pentel Presto pen. By far the best of the white oat pens that you can get. And I knocked out a few bits. And this one my, aunt, uh, my cat Oscar is uh, going crazy because he can't get in to my wife's studio. Cause she just needs some time to clean up, buddy. And she wants to run the AC. Oscar! What is it? Yeah! Some small patterns. For my creepy floral eyes. And coming up the middle for the nose. Just like a, if I enlarged it, what I'm doing is something like, so it's really like back and forth and back and forth, uh, but there's a, a regularity to the irregularity. And I'm making the same kind of arch compound shapes. So some of the patterns you could do to refine further control of that is to do things like, first of all, I like the, I call, think of this one as the chain, but also a metaphor I often use in class, is think of footballers jumping from tire to tire. And a chain that's gapped out nicely like that, you can actually go in and make into a chain. And then last thing you need is a little bit on each side. So it's a cartoon chain. You can use a, a more controlled or constrained version of the same pattern. So you want to make that shape. And then from uh, just off the middle of it, make one of these. And one of the things you're doing when you do this as a pattern, the arch this way, mechanically for the hand, it's actually quite different than the arch this way. You're doing two very different movements back and forth, refining how to use those to get similar results. Uh, mirroring in that context is a good thing to practice. And I could go further and draw the more of a gap inside them. You know, depends on how much realism you're looking for. Uh, but good pattern, but even the, the quick arching thing like this, mechanically this arch, and it's more likely to do that when I stop thinking about it for a second, is different than this one. This one is relatively simple mechanically. This one requires a, a different scooping movement that's more awkward for the fingers. So working on making them similar is good practice. Then we have the branches. So again, we go back to fractals and, and patterns. I want to make a compound curve with a nice rhythm. And then I'm going to say, uh, it's, it's like an ivy sort of branching pattern. I'm going to split off this one. And then 
alternate. I'm going to alternate. And notice I'm keeping the spacing relatively even. I don't necessarily want to leave it that way, but it sort of depends on how groomed or regular or healthy a life this plant has had. A super healthy plant that's had no interference. So you know it's altering off the outside. And then I go inside. Outside first, then inside. Outside first. And inside. And now I've got one that's long enough, it's gonna start doing something interesting. I can start getting into the the double curve again. And now I've done this next pass, so I could fill in a few more here, get this more balanced. But I can start the next wave. So following the fractal pattern takes a lot of the decision-making work out of starting laying in the lines. But then you can do things like, okay, I'm going to say something got broken off there and start working in some of the signs of life. So it got broken and then started growing some more. And in this way you can use the sketching process to tell yourself a story about this thing you're sketching. Something broke that leaf, that branch, not that branch. So now I've got an interesting branching pattern. Instead of the, the crazy flowers, I'm just going to rough in for the sake of expediency because we're getting up to a half hour here. A foliage line. I want it to come in close, but not totally cover all of this. It just maybe make it interesting. Don't just don't just make a round shape. Add a few complexities. So that's just a boundary, and I'm going to do small. So this is sort of like some of these patterns that I'm doing in the very dense areas and I talked about filling in here. For the lower part. Now you can invent your own, but I find this a very efficient pattern for when it's in tight enough. I can go quite quickly without feeling too tense in the hand. I'm just making kind of a, a short, fast movement. I periodically need to stretch my hand, which is actually good to do. I like working a big ball of needle eraser that I keep. That's good. Doing hand stretches. I pop a lot. And I have ball bearings. Let's sharpen up. It's 
Sharpened tool. Yeah, definitely worn a bit. So that's going to give us a much cleaner line, too. It helps if you're able to Well, even I saw me doing this a minute ago. That was a signal to my wife that I'm recording. Not time to come and ask a thing. Wait until after. Uh, I wish I had like a red light I could but turn on. I could probably build that, couldn't I? I should do that. You know what? I have a, a red glass exit sign. I could totally adapt that. An idea is born. And I think, you know, this kind of uh, pattern, mixed pattern exercises and line control exercises will be fun for students to do because you end up with a fairly full and interesting page in your sketchbook or a sheet of paper. It doesn't really matter if you do this in your sketchbook or not, but hey, you've got a sketchbook. Here's something to practice with. Now, you could also use these squares for smaller patterns that you don't necessarily want to do as large an area of. And that's usually what I do, is just fill a bunch of the squares. I'm thinking pebbles now. Close to that, but smaller patterns, little pebbly shapes that look like a bush. There we go. A little involuntary composition exercise breakdown, doing pattern exercise based on the drawing from Crowning for Lessons coming up in Mind Engines. Um, I hope you find that entertaining, but also, like, do it, because it's, it's good practice. See you in the next video.